In this section, we're going to talk about optimization. We've already done some optimization problems earlier in Chapter 3, but now we are going to be doing problems that are word problems, and we need to translate those problems into the problems that we've seen earlier. So when we're talking about optimization, we're trying to find the global or absolute minimum or maximum of a function on some interval. So to start this section, we're going to look at a problem that we've seen before without any word problem, just something like finding the global min and global max of a function x cubed plus 3x squared plus 5 on some interval negative 4 to 2. Now remember, from the extreme value theorem, which we talked about earlier in chapter 3, that if we have a continuous function on a closed and bounded interval, we'll say to some interval a to b with closed brackets, then f has a global min and global max on that interval. So what this means is if we're dealing with a continuous function on a closed and bounded interval, we already know the global min and global max are going to exist, and we know that global min and global max have to occur at critical points. So what we can do is we can just find the critical points of the function and test which one's the biggest, which one's the smallest, to find the global min and global max. So let's do that. To find the critical points, we are going to find the derivative, set it equal to 0, so let's find the derivative first. This is going to be 3x squared plus 6x. We're going to set that equal to 0. We can factor out a 3x out of both terms, and we're left with 3x times x plus 2, which gives us two critical points, x equals 0 and x equals negative 2. We also have to be careful that we check when the derivative does not exist. 3x squared plus 6x 6x is a polynomial function. There's no issue there, but the derivative does not exist at endpoints. So we also have x equals negative 4 and 2 as critical points. So we have four critical points to deal with. x equals negative 4, negative 2, 0, and 2. And I know that the global min and max occur at the critical point, so it has to be at one of those four points. Our global min is 1, global max is 1. And we know that we can just check those four points and see which one is the biggest and which one is the smallest. So let's do that. We mean the biggest and smallest, we mean plugging it into the function. So we're going to look at f of negative 4, which will be negative 4 cubed plus 3 times negative 4 squared plus 5. We're going to look at f of negative 2. Negative 2 cubed plus 3 times negative 2 squared plus 5. Same thing with 0. And with 2. Whatever the biggest function value we get out is going to be our global max. Whatever the smallest one is going to be the global min. When we plug in negative 4, we're going to get a negative 47. When we plug in negative 2, we're going to get a positive 9. When we plug in 0, we're going to get a 5. 
and when we plug in 2, we will get 25. So this means that the global min is going to be at x equals negative 4, since negative 47 is the smallest value, and the global max is going to occur at x equals 2, since 25 is the largest value. So this is the process of optimization, minimizing or maximizing a function, finding the global min or global max of a function if we're given a continuous function like a polynomial on a closed and bounded interval like negative 4 to 2. But this is not always what we're going to have. We're not always going to be able to use the extreme value theorem. So let's look, look at the exact same function, but on a different interval here. Find the global min and global max of f of x equals x cubed plus 3x squared plus 5. Same function, but this time on the interval negative 1 to 1. And the idea here is that we cannot use the extreme value theorem. But we still know that the global min and global max, call that global extrema, occur at critical points. So it's going to be the same idea that we're going to find critical points, but we're going to need to test whether they are minimums or maximums. So here we go. We're going to find the derivative, same thing. Again, it's 3x squared plus 6x, set it equal to 0, and just like the previous problem, we can factor out a 3x, and we will have x equals 0, and x equals negative 2. However, this time, negative 2 is not in our domain, so we're not going to consider it. We also need to think about when does the derivative not exist. And this time we don't have endpoints, so we don't have to worry about negative 1 and 1, so there are no points to consider. So now we know that if there is a global extrema on our interval, it has to occur at 0, but we need to test the critical point x equals 0. We don't know if it's a global min, we don't know if it's a global max, we don't know if it's neither a min nor a max, we have to test it. And this is why the extreme value theorem is nice, because we don't need to do something like this. So to test this, we could use one of two things. We could use the first derivative test. That is going to be looking at 0, looking at f prime, and we need to plug in two numbers, something in between 0 and negative 1, so that's our domain, how about negative 1 half, something in between 0 and 1, how about 1 half, and we're going to plug it into the derivative. where the derivative is given by 3x times x plus 2. We care about the sign. This is going to be a negative number times a positive number. That's going to be a negative number. Same thing with 1 half. We'll have a positive number times a positive number, which is positive. And this means that the function is decreasing before 0 increasing after, so 0 is a local min. We could have also done this with the second derivative test. We don't need to use both of the tests 
just one or the other. But here we go. The second derivative test says that we need to find the second derivative. In this case, that's going to be 6x plus 6. And we're going to plug in our critical point into the second derivative, which will give us 6. And since that's greater than 0, then we know that 0 is a local min. The second derivative is positive. We know that the function is concave up at that point. And if it's a critical point, it has to be the bottom of that valley. So in either case, we have that 0 is a local min. We know the function is concave up. We know that it's going to be decreasing and then increasing. So 0 is going to be the global min. We'll say a global min occurs at 0. And there's going to be no global max because our function is going to look like this in some way, where I have open holes at the endpoints. And we're not going to be able to have a maximum function. So we are going to have no global max. We don't have to have a global min and global max. If I had a closed and bounded interval, I'd be guaranteed to have one, but I don't necessarily have that here. So when we're trying to be doing these optimization problems, we're going to be coming up with a function and a domain, and we will much rather have a closed and bounded domain. The process is much easier than having a domain that is open or unbounded going to infinity. So we are going to do the exact same problem, except we have to translate a word problem into a function and a domain in order to find the global min and global max. So let's not forget the goal of the problem is to find a global minimum and or a global maximum of a function on some interval. We're trying to optimize the function. That is, we're trying to minimize the function or maximize the function. So here is the idea. We're going to have five steps to kind of guide us through these problems. First step when we're ever dealing with some kind of word problem is going to be something like drawing a picture if possible and assigning variables. That's another way of just saying we're trying to understand what the problem is asking. We said in the related rates section that this is often the most difficult part of a word problem is just trying to understand what the problem is asking. You're trying to translate the information you're given into math. Once we have a good picture, once we assign the variables, we're going to write an expression for the quantity we are trying to minimize or maximize. This is the function that I'm going to be trying to deal with. And this is oftentimes going to be given in two variables, which is an issue. So step three is we're going to write the expression above in one variable as a function. That is, we're going to relate the two variables together using some kind of equation given in the problem. This is similar to the idea of related rates, where we have an equation that relates the two variables together. It's an equation with both those variables in it. This will give us our function f. Then we need to figure out the domain. So when we're talking about domain, it's not going to necessarily be the domain of the function, but what values make sense in the context of the problem. And note that we want a closed and bounded domain if possible, so that we can use the extreme value theorem. All of that is to find a function and domain. Step five is using the process of finding critical points, using the first derivative test, second derivative test, plugging in the values of the function to find the global min or global max. We've done that part before. That's all the math that we need to do. But all the difficulty lies in step one through four. We're just going to write that step one through four is used to find our function f of x or f of y or whatever variable we're going to use and a domain. So now let's jump into our first example. We're going to find two non-negative numbers whose sum is 1. So 4 times the first number plus the cube of the second is as small as possible. 
and step one here, we are going to draw a picture if possible and assign variables. You can try to understand what the question is asking. In this case, there's not really a picture to draw, but we can say that we have two variables. We'll call them X and Y right now. The two things that we don't know in this problem are what is the first number and what is the second number. And we're trying to find what are the two numbers so that something happens. So four times the first number plus the key with the second is as small as possible. Step two, we're going to find an expression of, the, uh, of what we are trying to maximize or minimize. And in this case, we are trying to minimize minimize because as small as possible we are trying to minimize four times the first number plus the cube of the second. So that's going to be four times the first number I translated first number as X plus the second number Y cubed. I'm trying to minimize this expression 4X plus Y cubed. On the previous page Two, we said that often we will be given this expression in two variables. In this case, we have x and y, 4x plus y cubed. That's an issue. We don't know how to deal with things in two variables. So step three is I need to rewrite one of the variables in terms of the other. I need another equation, another expression, in our problem that relates the two variables. And in this case, we get that information from whose sum is one. We know that if I take the first number plus the second number, I should get a sum of one. That is an equation that relates the two variables. And that's what we're looking for in these problems. And the reason I want this is so that I can rewrite 4x plus y cubed in terms of one variable. So for instance, I could write x is equal to 1 minus y and I could plug in x And this will give me 4 times 1 minus y plus y cubed. And this would be my function. We'll call it f of y. And a quick note here. We could have written... y equals 1 minus x and replaced y, that would be giving us 4x plus 1 minus x cubed. This would be our function of x. And there's no issue here except that maybe, and this is really kind of a personal preference, preference maybe this is more difficult to deal with. At least I think so. Okay, but we could have done it that way. And there's no issue if that's the way that you want to go. All right, step four. We need to find the domain of this function. Now, when we're talking about domain, we're going to use this 4 times 1 minus y plus y cubed. There's no issues in that function itself of the domain, but what makes sense in the problem? In this case, we are given that x and y 
are non-negative. That means greater than or equal to zero. And since we're dealing with y as our variable, we know that y has to be greater than or equal to zero. So this means that our interval, our domain, of f of y is going to be bracket 0 to infinity. However, that's not really our domain. We can actually make it much, much better than that because we can think about what if I plug in some big value like 100. If y is 100, x would have to be negative 99 to give a sum of 1 and that wouldn't work because x has to be non-negative. So we're really not going to be going up to infinity. We have maybe some more work to do for this. In order to figure out the domain of these problems we're going to ask two questions. What's the smallest value y can be and what's the largest value y can be. So the smallest value y can be, we answered that, that can be 0. But for the largest value, we just said that y can't be something like 100. So what's the largest value? You may have already guessed that it's 1, but to answer that question, you can also answer the question, what's the smallest value x can be? And in that case, we know the answer is 0 for the same reasoning. And if we have x plus y equal to 1, then we can say 0 plus y is equal to 1, or y is equal to 1, which gives us our largest value of 1. Now in this first problem, it may not be difficult to figure out that domain 0 to 1, but that kind of reasoning is going to help us in problems that are much more difficult to think about what those values will be. In either case, we have our domain bracket 0, to bracket 1. And that's nice because we want a closed and bounded domain if possible so that we can use the extreme value theorem. So let's go on. Now we've done step 1 through 4. Now we can just do the math thing. We are trying to, we're going to rewrite this now, step 5. We are trying to find the global min of the function 4 times 1 minus y plus y cubed on the interval 0 to 1. And maybe it might be nice to rewrite f of y as 4 minus 4y plus y cubed. So now this is just a problem that we've seen earlier. We're going to need to find the critical points. We're going to find the derivative. In this case, that's going to be negative 4 plus 3y squared. We're going to set that derivative equal to 0. This will give us 3y squared equals 4. y squared equals 4 thirds y is going to be positive negative 2 over root 3. We can also think about when is the derivative not exist. In this case it's going to be at endpoints or y equals 0, y equals 1. 
Now note that y equals negative 2 over root 3 is not in the domain. It is less than 0. And also, y equals positive 2 over square root of 3 is also not in the domain. It is a number that is greater than 1. This is like square root of 4 over square root of 3. Square root of 4 thirds, which is a greater than 1. So both of these critical points aren't actually critical points of our function. Our only critical points are 0 and 1. Since I have a closed and bounded domain, now all I need to do is plug this into the function, see which one is the biggest, and that is going to be, or sorry, the smallest, that's going to be our global min. So we're going to plug in f of 0. That's going to give us 4. And f of 1 is going to give us 4 minus 4 times 1 plus 1 cubed will give us 1 which means that our global min occurs at y equals 1. We have to go back to the problem for a second now and just make sure we're answering the question uh, correctly. We are trying to find two non-negative numbers whose sum is 1. such that, that that thing is as small as possible. So the answer needs to be what are our two non-negative numbers. We know that y is equal to 1. We also know that x plus y is equal to 1. So this means that x is going to be 0. So our answer is our first number is 0 and our second number is 1. Although you may have done all the work to get to the global min at y equals 1, our answer has to be the two numbers together. All right, let's look at another problem now. In this one, we want to build a fence that encloses a rectangular yard. A river runs alongside one side of the yard, and no fence is needed for this side. What is the largest yard you could have enclosed by your fence if you have 1,000 feet of fencing? In this case, step one, again, we are going to try to draw a picture and assign variables. And in this case, the picture can be very, very useful. So we have some river. And we're going to build some fence. That's going to create some rectangular yard. Get a nice fence, and we're going to enclose some yard. So we are trying to find what is the largest yard that we could possibly have, given that I only have a thousand feet of fencing. And we need to think about what two variables can we use in order to figure this out? Well, if I want to deal with area, if I want to think about 1,000 feet of fencing, I'm going to care about what are the lengths of the side of the fence. So our two variables are going to be, we'll call it L, the length of the fence, W, the width of the fence. You can call these whatever you want, but we're just going to do length, and width. And we're going to think about what kind of fences could we have. So it's just a little exercise. Let's draw some possible fences. 
we could have a width of 100. And this means that the length would be 800 in closing my yard. We could have something like a width of 300 we could have a length of in this case we would have 400 left here I'm closing my yard draw two more what about a width of 400 in this case the length is only 200 and one more we're gonna draw a really really stupid fence now what if I had a width of just one the length in that case would be 998 and this is a very very stupid yard but it's possible we could have it now let's think about what the area of these guys will be the area for this fence would be 1 times 8 is going to be 8 four zeros area here would be 12,000 sorry 120,000 over here we would have another 880,000 and over here would be an area of 998. You can make some kind of hypothesis as to what is going to be the largest area. We saw that from our four guesses, 120,000 was our largest area, but we want to find exactly what the largest area is going to be and what dimension is going to give us that largest area. Okay, this is again understanding the problem, trying to figure out what we're actually trying to do with this information. Let's erase this exercise and let's continue on with our problem. Step two, I need to figure out what I'm trying to minimize or maximize. In this case, I am trying to maximize because I have the largest yard. the area which we're going to be given as length times width. Now this is again something given in two variables L and W and step three is I need to rewrite one of the variables in terms of the other. I need some kind of other equation that's going to relate those two variables and in this case that is going to be given by the fact that we have 1,000 feet of fencing. We're going to use the perimeter has to be equal to 1,000 feet. How much fence do we have restricts what L and W can be. So in this case, our perimeter is going to be 2W plus L. That's the amount of fence that we have, and that's going to be equal to 1,000. And the reason we do this is so that we can rewrite one variable in terms of the other. We have a choice of L or W. 
In this case, we're going to say that L is 1,000 minus 2W. And when we plug this back into our area, we have area is going to be 1,000 minus 2W times W or 1000 W minus 2 W squared and this is our function we'll call it F of W. Step 4 we need to find the domain of that function. So we're going to be asking what is the largest value of W and what is the smallest value of W that makes sense in the problem. In this case the largest value of W that could make sense, well we could think about it's going to be maybe a thousand. We only have a thousand feet of fencing so W could be a thousand. But if we take a little more look at it we can see that that's actually not going to be true because I'm going to have then thousand feet here and a thousand feet on the other side that's already two thousand feet so here actually the easier question to answer is what is the smallest value of w and in this case that's just going to be zero and let's take a quick note if w equals zero this is um, what I like to call a really dumb fence. W equals zero, then this is just a fence with length 1,000 right up against the river. It's not really enclosing any area. In this case, actually, the area is zero. But that's okay to think about that zero because I do want a closed and bounded domain. And if I include that zero, I now have my closed and bounded domain. In order to think about the largest W, I can instead think about what is the smallest L. And in this case, the smallest L is also zero. Plugging that into my other equation, I have that 2W plus that zero is equal to a thousand, this will give me that W equals 500. And that will be the largest width that I could have. So my domain is bracket zero to 500 knowing that if W is 0 or 500, either one I have a really, really dumb fence, the area will be 0, but I want a closed and bounded domain so that I can use the extreme value theorem. Alright, so now we have translated this problem into a math problem that we've done before, step 5. So we have Find the global max of the function 1000w minus 2w squared on the interval 0 to 500. Since I have a closed and bounded domain, I am able to use the extreme value theorem. I need to find the derivative find the critical points, see which one is going to give me the largest value to find the global max. So let's find the derivative first. It's going to give me 1000 minus 4w. And I'm going to set that derivative equal to 0. Solve for w and I get w is equal to 
I also need to think about when does the derivative not exist. And that's going to be at the endpoints only here. W equal to 0 and 500. Then I just need to plug in those critical points into my function. Look at f of 0, f of 250, f of 500. And note that f of 0 and f of 500 are both going to give us 0. That was kind of by design that we picked the two sort of extreme values that we have really stupid fences and stupid yards with an area of 0. This is kind of hinting that our answer is going to be 250. We can double check just real quick. We have 1,000 times 250 minus 2 times 250 squared, which gives us 125,000, in this case, feet squared. So the question says, what is the largest yard? It doesn't ask for the dimensions. In this case, it's just answering, or just asking for the 125,000 feet squared. All right, let's go to the next example. In this case, we have a box of volume 72 meters cubed with a square bottom and no top is constructed from two different materials. The cost of the bottom is $40 per meter squared and the cost of the sides is $30, that should say, per meter squared. Find the dimensions of the box that minimize cost. So step one, I need to draw a picture so I can understand what's going on here. I have a box here and it matters that the bottom of the box is different than the sides of the box. So let's draw first the bottom of this box. It has one material. And the sides of the box have a different material. And there is no top to this box. All right. We know that the base of this box is a square. So the dimensions of a square, we're going to call this length and width if you want. But since it's a square, we only really have one since w is equal to l. We'll just call that l, the length of the side l. The side length of the base. And then we also have that we need to consider h, which is the height. of the box. And we're trying to see, we're interested in volume at some point. In order to find volume, you have length times width times height. And we're going to have to deal with something about the cost of the sides and the bottom. Okay, step two. We need to figure out what we're trying to minimize or maximize. This case is given us right there. We're trying to minimize cost. But we need a formula for what the cost is going to be. In this case, we're going to have the cost of the bottom. plus the cost of the sides. All 
the cost of the bottom is going to give us forty dollars per meter squared how many meters squared do I have well that's going to give me L squared it's the area of the bottom and for the cost of the sides we're gonna have thirty dollars that's how much per meter the sides cost per meter squared and how much do I have for the sides well that's gonna be length times height is the area of one side and I have four sides so four times length times height so this is the area of one side and there are four sides to deal with so our cost equation is going to be 40 L squared plus 30 times 4 write that as 120 L H just as the previous two problems our equation we're trying to minimize is given in two variables L and H and step three is I'm going to need to rewrite one of the variables in terms of the other. Given some other equation in the problem. And in this case, the other information we're given is that the box has a volume of 72 meters cubed. Sometimes this is called the constraint equation. We are constraining our two variables L and H given some other information in the problem, the volume. If we didn't have that constraint, the minimal cost we could have would just be having a box that's very, 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 very small or nothing would cost a zero. So in this case, we have that volume is 72 meters cubed. And volume for a box is going to be length times width. In this case, that's just going to be length again times height or just L squared H and again I need to rewrite one variable in terms of the other in this case I am going to write H is equal to 72 over L squared or I could write L squared is equal to 72 over H and L is equal to the square root of 72 over H. That seems like that might be a little more difficult to do. So I'm going to stick with H 72 over L squared. Plugging this in, I'm going to have the cost equation is 40 L squared plus 120L times 72 over L squared. Simplifying this, we have 40L squared plus 120 times 72, 8,640 over L. This is going to be my function f of l. All right, now I need to figure out what is going to be the domain. So step four here. I need to figure out what is going to be the largest l. and the smallest value of L. The smallest value of L is maybe the easiest to deal with. 
we know that the smallest value of L can be zero, but note that it can't be equal to zero Otherwise, volume would be equal to zero. And same kind of idea, if I have the largest L, I could think about instead the smallest H. Smallest H would be zero, but not equal to zero. And this is just going to give that the largest L can be anything. It can go up to infinity. So our domain here is parentheses 0 to infinity. And this is not closed and bounded. And that's too bad, but that's the way that this problem is going to work. If we go back to our function again, think about L. L can be really, really, really small. We could draw a picture of some kind of uh, L here. We could have a really small base and a really tall height. L could be like 0.0001. This just means that our height would be big. Or we could have a very, very small height. And a really, really big L, maybe like L is equal to a thousand. This just means that H would be really, really small. But we could still make it work. We don't have to deal with all just integer values. So now step five. I've now translated this problem into a math equation, math problem that we've seen before. We are trying to find the global min of the function f of l equal to 40l squared plus 8,640 over l on the domain 0 to infinity. Now I can't use the extreme value theorem, but the same first step is the case that I need to find the derivative and find the critical points. So f prime of l is going to be 80l minus 8640 over l squared. Again, that's saying that this is equal to 8,640 times L to the negative 1 and using the power rule. Okay, we need to set this equal to 0. Find the critical points. We can multiply by L squared everywhere. That's going to give us 80 L cubed minus 8,640 equals 0. 80L cubed equals 8,640. That's L cubed is equal to 108. So L is going to be the cubed root of 108, which we could write as 3 cube root of 4. We might just keep it as cube root of 108 right now. So that is one of our critical points right there. We also need to consider when does the derivative not exist. This is uh, true at L equals 0, but note that this is not in our domain. So the only critical point that I can deal with is at L equals cube root of 108. 
Now, although we may guess that that is our answer of what our L needs to be, we need to verify that this is a global min. We need to verify that this is a local min. Since I don't have the extreme value theorem, I need to be careful here. I need to use the first derivative test or second derivative test. In this case, I'm going to use the second derivative test. I think that's going to be the easiest one here. I need to find the second derivative. In this case, that's going to be 80 plus 2 times 8,640 over L cubed. And all I really care about is whether this is positive or negative. And if I plug in some positive number, everything is positive here. This is going to be greater than 0, which means that L equal to the cube root of 108 is a local min. It is the bottom of a valley since it's concave up. And since this is the only critical point, this means that everything else is going to be greater than that value. This means that the global min occurs at this. This is going to be also the global min since it's the only critical point. So our question asks for what is the dimensions of the box. We know that L is cube root of 108. And we can find H by plugging this into our equation. H is equal to 72 over L squared. 72 over cube root of 108 squared. 72 over 108 to the 2 thirds power. And that's going to be our dimensions, our answer. Make sure we have units. It's going to be cubed root of 108 meters by cubed root of 108 meters by 72 108 to the 2 thirds power meters. Three dimensions, since I'm thinking about a box, length and width are the same. All right, and let's look at one more problem for optimization. This one, given 10 feet of wire, we want to construct a square and a circle by cutting the wire and forming shapes. How much wire should be used for the square and for the circle to maximize the area inside the square and the circle? So step one here. I need to draw a picture. I have some wire, we'll call this 10 feet of wire, and I'm going to cut this wire somewhere so that the first part of that wire is going to be used for the square, and the second part of the wire is going to be used for the circle. So that first part of wire, I'm going to bend it into a shape, a square. That second piece, I'm going to bend it into a circle. And I need to assign some variables. I think there's a couple different ways of doing it. One way that I could do it. I could also label the radius. two variables, but I'm going to do it a different way here. You can try it that way. You should get the exact same answer. But I'm going to look at instead how I'm cutting the beginning here. And the reason I'm going to do that is because it's easier to relate the two variables. We're going to get rid of one of the steps right away. The amount of wire I use for this we'll call y Circle. We know that 
circumference 2 pi r. to so r is equal to there are positives and negatives to doing it where I have x and y be the parts of a wire or if I have x and y be the side length of the square and the radius of the circle it's really your personal opinion which one's going to work better. All right, step two. You need to find what I'm minimizing or maximizing. In this case, I am trying to maximize the area. That's going to be the area of the square. Plus the area of the circle. The area of the square is going to be side length x over 4 squared. And the area of the circle is going to be pi r squared. But now we know that we have r is y over 2 pi. Again, this is given in two variables, x and y. So step three, I need an equation that relates x and y, and in this case, if I have x and y given the way I did, that equation is easy to come by. We know that x plus y has to be equal to the 10 feet of wire, or that y is equal to 10 minus x, or x is equal to 10 minus y, whichever one you prefer. And this means that our area is going to be given as x over 4 squared plus pi times 10 minus x over 2 pi squared. And this is our function f of x. Let's simplify this a little bit. This is going to be x squared over 16 plus pi times, leave this as 10 minus x squared over 4 pi squared. We have a pi and a pi cancel out. And this will give us x squared over 16 plus 1 over 4 pi, 10 minus x squared. Step 4, we need to find the domain. We need to think about what is the smallest x that I can have, and what is the largest x that I can have. In this case, the smallest x that I can have is going to be 0. That means that I'm having no square, all circle. And the largest value is going to be 10. That is all square, no circle. In order to find largest x, you could think about the smallest value of y, which is 0. And then we know that x plus y is equal to 10. And there it gives us our 10 for x. In either case, we have our domain is equal to bracket 0 to 10. And our function 
x squared over 16 plus 1 over 4 pi, 10 minus x squared. So now we have, finally, that I'm trying to find the global max of the function x squared over 16 plus 1 over 4 pi 10 minus x quantity squared on the interval 0 to 10. I'm going to use the extreme value theorem here. I need to find the critical points, plug in the critical points to the function, and the largest one is going to be my global max. So first step here, find the derivative f prime of x. That's going to give us 1 eighth x, 2x over 16, 1 eighth x. And over here is going to be 2 over 4 pi 10 minus x times negative 1 using the chain rule, the derivative of 10 minus x. We could write that as 1 eighth x plus 1 over 2 pi, sorry, minus 1 over 2 pi. Let's rewrite that again, sorry. 1 eighth x minus 1 over 2 pi 10 minus x. And I'm going to try to set this equal to 0. Do a little algebra here. It's going to be 1 eighth x minus 5 over pi plus x over 2 pi equal to 0. Or that I have 5 over pi on this side and I have a 1 eighth plus 1 over 2 pi x on this side, so x is going to be 5 over pi over 1 eighth plus 1 over 2 pi. And this is approximately 5.59 or 5.6. I'm just going to use that as a base value. We're going to keep the exact value if we need it. We're just going to think about 5.6 here. We also need to think about when does the derivative not exist. This is going to happen at endpoints only. x equals 0 and 10. So now the problem boils down to plugging in our three values. f of 0, f of 5.6, about and f of 10. f of 0 is going to give us 1 over 4 pi times 10 squared or 100 over 4 pi 25 over pi f of about 5.6 it's going to give us about 3.5 also know that 25 divided by pi is about 7.96 and if I plug in 10 that's going to give me 100 over 16, which is 6.25. So although this 5.6 was a critical point, we needed to look for it, it's not our global max. Our global max occurs at x equals 0. So our answer is that we should use all of the wire 
for the circle. So there are a few examples of optimization problems in your homework you're going to be dealing with a lot more. Optimization is commonly a very difficult subject and the reason why it's difficult is that in the problems that you're going to be doing and the problems you're going to see in the future are going to look much different than the problems that we did here. There are a lot of different problems to do and you just need to keep on practicing those as much as you can. I would try not to remember how to do specific problems. Don't try to understand how to do yard problems and wire problems and volume problems. Try to really understand what is the general idea of what I'm trying to do so that I could give you a brand new problem and you'd still be able to tackle it. If you try to understand how to do individual problems, this will be a very, very difficult section for you because there are lots of different problems that you could do. Best of luck in dealing with optimization.